Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to the BCS uh, Financial Services Specialist Group event. Uh, please note that this event will be recorded. My name is Chikese Ekinyal. I'm the Industrial Liaison Officer and Inclusion Officer for the BCS Financial Services Specialist Group. I'm really excited about our topic talk presentation today and hearing from a esteemed guest speaker, Maximiliano Castelli, who we've lined up. I'll be starting off with a brief introduction of our guest speaker, followed by his presentation. There will be a Q&A session after the presentation. Please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A chat function and Max or Maximiliano would answer those questions um, during the session. Uh, Maximiliano Castelli is a head of strategy, sovereign institutions at UBS Asset Management and a member of the UBS Sovereign Investment Management Committee. He's a global thought leader in the sovereign wealth management area, a financial expert and a writer. He has published a book, The New Economics of Sovereign Wealth Fund, and is often quoted in the media. So I'm going to be handing you over to Max now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chikiz. And sorry about, uh, it will be a little bit, I will have to switch from one presentation to the other because uh, that's the reason of the delay is that uh, we had some uh, technical issues, which of course are completely on my side because very often banks are heavy regulated entities. It's very complicated to move from one platform to the other. So uh, as, uh, as it was, uh, I would like, first of all, uh, to introduce the topic and then uh, I will uh, share with you some uh, slides. So the topic of my talk today, it is uh, entitled From the Collapse of Bretton Woods to Digital Currency. Now, for I am an economist by training, so I'm, I don't expect all of you to know what Bretton Woods is but I'm sure that you might have heard about it. As you might know, in the about uh, now more than in 1994, so uh, already more than almost 70 years ago, there was created the so-called Bretton Woods system. And this was the system when uh, uh, all the global currency from any country were pegged to the dollar, which at the same time, of course, was pegged to, the go to gold. So this was the so-called fixed exchange rate system. This system actually lasted, uh, it was created in 1994. The data is not uh, by chance because in reality, this is the end of the Second World War where pretty clearly the US came out as the dominant economy from both a political, but I would say also very importantly from a financial and economic point of view. Just think about what will follow in the following years, including the Marshall Plan in Europe and the, the spreading of the U.S. Uh, dominance from a political perspective around the world. Now, this system of fixed exchange rate uh, with the dollar at the center actually resisted until 1971. So exactly 50 years ago, the, the, um, uh, the U.S. shocked the world when they decided to end the convertibility of the US dollar with gold. This was called at the time, it has been, it will be remembered as the Nixon shock. So what happened in 1971 is that we move into the regime of uh, currency and they would say of the global financial system that actually has been enduring until now. And this system has been based on some important uh, uh, pillars. First of all, it was not a peg system, so currency were not pegged, but they were floating. So a floating exchange rate system where currency were, in a, generalizing a little bit, were fixed by the market. And of course, the capital flow were also free to move around borders. The US dollar, without being any more linked to the, to the gold, became the de facto global currency against which any international transaction was put was done. Now, this is very important because this, uh, this actually system 
has going through 50 years where we had so many shocks to the global economy and the, all these shocks have not in some way dented the more fundamental pillar of this global financial system. We had, uh, however, in, uh, in terms, sorry, we had, the, for instance, uh, the oil price shock during the 70s with the very high inflation rate, which of course impacted the dollar as well. We have the tech bubble burst in the early 2000. We had the great financial crisis in 2008, which was actually originated in the US real estate sector. We had actually the pandemic, as we are still in the middle of it. Throughout all this crisis, the US dollar has remained the undisputed leader and dominant currency in the global financial system. What does it mean when I say the dominant currency? It means that I will, and I will tell you a little bit more in a minute, that the dollar has fundamentally been the currency used in the majority of the international transaction, has been the currency which represents the bulk of the reserve used by central banks to support their own currency. And it is actually very important also the currency to which investor and in general uh, consumer or even and, and the corporates turn during period of financial stress when they search for security. This has not changed over the last 15 years. However, if I look at now where we are now, and here we are talking about a period going from 2008 onwards, it all started, I would say, with the great financial crisis. We had some important developments. And let me mention some of them. The first one is the rise of China. And with regards to the global financial system, the rise of the RMB uh, the, or Yuan, which is, uh, of course, uh, the currency of China. We also had, the, for, since 2008, the almost existential crisis of the euro, the only system of fixed exchange rates which was launched after the collapse of uh, Bretton Woods uh, in 1971, at least a, a significant one. This crisis actually put into jeopardy the whole euro project. Now, if we look at it instead, we, I would say that we have a revival of the euro which show that it's pretty resilient as an international as a currency, and actually the existential threat to the currency to the euro area project has actually weakened very much. So what I'm trying to say is that in the world we have uh, some currency which are starting to play a competitive role versus the dollar. What we also had has been a so-called deglobalization, or if you want, we starting to see the gradual shifting of the global economy, including the global financial markets, towards what we sometimes label as a multipolar system and a multi-currency system eventually. And I will go back on that uh, shortly. I would like also to add another three important factors that are very much uh, having an impact on the global financial architecture. The first one are political developments in the US. Since the Trump election, of course, we had a completely different political agenda. We are talking about the China-US confrontation. In the market, we talk about China-US decoupling. We're talking about basically the geopolitical competition between the two dominant forces in the global economy, which inevitably also has an impact on the global financial architecture. And I will come back on that when we will talk about the digital yuan. Finally, we have another two important uh, uh, factors which have come over the last few years, which I believe are very, very important. The first one is the rise of fintech and, and the, so the importance of fintech. So all the innovation that we are experiencing in the financial service industry, and most important in the rise of digital currency. And these are for, uh, this is going to be the main topic of this presentation. Before I move and I jump into that, let me mention that there has been something else, else which happened actually and is still happening, which is COVID-19. COVID-19 per se is not something that, of course, is related to the financial sector directly, because COVID-19 is an health crisis, and which, of course, can have important economic repercussion. But what COVID-19 did has been a very strong acceleration 
accelerator of some important global trends. I already mentioned to you deglobalization. I mentioned to you the geopolitical competition between the two largest economies in the world. But actually, COVID-19 also had an important impact on digitization because it really accelerated the process which was already ongoing, bringing the sort of acceptance of digital tools from e-commerce, from the from digital, from home working, but as well to the use of uh, digital payment tools. So um, a, a substantial reduction in the use of cash, which of course has also had an impact on the development of the financial service industry. So this is the topic of the today, is the topic of the rise of digital currency. And the fundamental question that I will try to address is, will the global financial system, which has been centered around the US dollar, eventually be disrupted by the rise of digital currency? In the same way as many other sectors of our global economic system, think about, uh, think about uh, commerce, think about retail, and also the labor market are being disrupted by the emerging digital tools. So let me immediately jump into this, uh, into this topic. Before I do that, let me go back a little bit about what does it mean to have a global system which is dominated by, um, by the dollar. And uh, which is, as I said, has been prevailing over the last 15 years. For doing, for doing that, let me go out from this. Sorry, I just need a second. I share my screen. Let's see if it works. It should. Here we are. So I'm going to use, uh, before I uh, to do that, I'm going to use uh, the result of a survey that we have been carrying out, that actually we carry out every year uh, for uh, more than 25 years now, which is uh, the survey of central banks done by my team uh, at UBS Asset Management. The survey that I'm showing to you in the screen and please let me know if you don't see it, is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is available on our website and can be accessed by anyone. So let me, let me tell you that uh, the survey basically does uh, uh, check exactly how the so-called foreign exchange reserves are evolving to try. To try. And actually, if I think about the, the composition of foreign exchange reserve, they have not changed very much over the last 50 years. They, they've grown dramatically in size, but if you look at the composition in terms of reserves, they are still the, dominated by the dollar. Actually, the dollar has been oscillating at the reach a peak of 70% in terms of the total. We are talking about $12 trillion of reserves globally. Has been uh, oscillating, has been going down a little bit when the euro was launched, but currently stand at around 60% of the total. So there has been a little reduction, which is largely explained by the rise of the euro, but in reality, two thirds of reserve in the world are still accounted for by dollar denominated assets, in particular by dollar denominated by US Treasury. Now, since instead uh, in the last few years, so we had uh, China has not become only a very important motor of growth for the global economy, it is already in uh, the second largest economy and actually will become very, very soon the first in terms of size. But also from a financial perspective, China has always had as a clear goal, the so-called internationalization of the RMB. So what China is trying to do with the RMB is what many countries have been trying to do in the past, which is to reduce their dependency on the dollar for when they do international transactions. And basically, this is something that, of course, has a cost for country. Sometimes it was labeled, you might remember, historian will remember what uh, the French president in the 50s, he called it the exorbitant privilege of the dollar. The fact that this currency, by being used by everybody in, when doing international transaction, give some important benefits in terms of political uh, influence to the actual issuing currency, which is the US. But actually, if you look at uh, the last few years, we actually see central banks started to diversify much more aggressively. That's what you see, for instance, in the question that we have been asking for, a very, for quite a few years now about uh, central banks investing their reserve into RMB. And here you can see that actually 
I will the percentage of central banks that have been that can invest so that they've been allowed by their regulation to invest in RMB has been steadily rising since 2015 and actually has reached now more than 80 percent. Actually, we also, uh, I, I, I cannot share the number, but uh, if you look at the current hard data on the currency composition of the foreign exchange reserve, by the second quarter of 2021, China already rise to nearly 3%, which sounds a very little number, but in reality is significant because it is started from zero just a few years back. And actually, I be, we, our, in base, based on our questionnaire and on the question that we ask to central banks around the world, we think that this purchase will soon rise to 5%, which is the target average tar currency allocation for the RMB. And it is realistic to expect that this trend will continue over the years. So what will happen is that we are going to see very soon and when I mean very soon, by talking in the world of uh, central banking of in the next decade, probably we are going to see a, a, a composition of reserve where the dollar will probably fall even more towards maybe the 50%. And the euro will remain in the area of 20, 25%, which is the current share. And the RMB eventually could reach a level of 10%, which would make it the third most important currency in the world. Now, this is very important because uh, one message that I always give when I talk about this topic is that ultimately is demand which decide the success of the international currency. The dollar is successful not just because the dollar is the largest economy in the world, but because demand for dollar has remained strong over the last 15 years. And as I mentioned, this has not changed during period of crisis, even when these crises were originated into the US itself, like for instance, the 2008 great financial crisis. Now, what, uh, what I would like to, um, what does it mean in terms of, uh, um, in terms of, uh, of evolution? First of all, it means that uh, we are, as I mentioned, the world is already moving towards a multipolar system. And this is very important because uh, I will mention to you competition between digital currency, which I believe it is the competition that we are seeing and we will see more between the US, Europe and China. And when I mean Europe, I mean, of course, the Euro. Let me now move to the topic of the rise of digital currency. So why, as I mentioned to you, together with other trends, the rise of digital currency is very important for the future of the global financial system. I would say that there is a host of factors that have been driving the digital disruption in the global financial sector. The first one, of course, it is the rise of blockchain and DLT, distributed ledger technology. Why? Because the blockchain and the DLT allow for the creation of of a consensus of replicated, share and synchronized digital data geographically spread across multiple sites, countries and institutions. So what is very important about blockchain and DLT is that no central administrator is needed in order to make the system work. So if the, the global financial system is centered around the US dollar, of course it will work only when the Fed will provide the liquidity to the system in the world in order to allow this transaction to happen. But the blockchain and DLT in principle would allow to move away from the intermediation of the banking system and, they, and, and of course the control of a centralized authority. So the second, of, the second important uh, uh, element has been, uh, um, as I mentioned to you, has been the COVID-19. Now there are very, very, as I mentioned to you, COVID-19 accelerated the move away from digital car from uh, of digital car the move away from cash and make digitization much faster in terms of adoption. According to some estimate, about five years we had an acceleration in the digitization of the banking sector. This is very important. Say so, over element, it is about. Uh, an important topic of conversation in the financial service industry nowadays, in particular from an investment perspective, which is the fear of traditional currency debasement. You will hear this view in the market. I 
tend not to agree, but you will hear that uh, as a result of the great financial crisis and more than a decade of uh, an orthodox monetary policy, which has been a massive injection of liquidity from central banks into the global financial system to keep the economies afloat, eventually this will lead to a failure of the so-called fiat currency or traditional currency, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the one, the paper money, the one, the one which are issued by central banks of the most developed economies. Finally, the rise of Bitcoin, not because Bitcoin itself can replace the traditional currency, but because of Bitcoin, has laid the foundation of a digital currency ecosystem. And what is very important, and I will show you the result of our survey on this topic, I believe it is also trigger uh, an acceleration in the, in, among the central banks in order to innovate and prepare for the issuance of so-called central, uh, digit, central banks digital currency. Now, so this is the background of where we are now. So what are a central bank? What are digital currencies? This is a little bit, uh, uh, sometimes can become a very technical, but fundamentally, when you look at uh, uh, digital currency, you can look at this uh, from a different perspective. And then we have basically, broadly speaking, three main types of digital currency. And this is something which I really stress is very important because very often there is a lot of confusion between uh, Bitcoin and central bank digital currency, in reality, they are very different things. Because first of all, it depends on who is the issuer. So a digital currency, as I mentioned, can be issued by a private sector, or it can be issued by uh, a central bank. Uh, in this case, there will be two very different things. It can be issued in a different form. It can be transferred in diff according to different mechanisms. For instance, it can be done in a centralized or it can be done in a decentralized way. And then the important is the question of accessibility. You can have a digital currency that can be used only for so-called, in the jargon, wholesale transaction, which is transaction between uh, central banks and financial institutions and commercial banks, uh, or it can be made available to the retail sector, to the end consumer. So if you take into account all these different way of looking at so-called digital currency, fundamentally there are three types of digital currency out there. The first one is the electronic money, uh, so-called, sorry, central banks and digital currency, which is electronic money denominated in the national unit of account of the country and represent a direct claim on the central banks. For example, the, the uh, e yuan, the digital yuan, which is already ongoing as a pilot in China. Then we have another a category, a second category of this digital currency, which is stable coins, which are private currency pegged to a national currency. I can give an example, could be for instance, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Libra, and then DM. Third type of currency are the so-called cryptocurrency, which is the the one are receiving a lot of uh, uh, coverage in the media nowadays, also because of their performance in the market, which are privately issued digital assets with their own unit of accounts and decentralized. Example of the most obvious, of course, is Bitcoin. Now, for me, the big revolution in the world of global, on the global financial system will come from central banks and digital currency. Because central banks and digital currency have the potential to, prom to profoundly change the modus operandi of the global financial system. So that we go back to the question that I asked at the beginning of the presentation. Let me, uh, what, if, if I can give uh, two examples of the digital currency, for instance, we have a project for the wholesale central banks and digital currency, where Switzerland is involved which is uh, handled by the Bank for International uh, Settlement Innovation Hub, which is called Project Helvetia, which is basically the creation, is they are testing a wholesale infrastructure in cooperation with the Swiss National Bank and the stock market in, uh, in Switzerland to see if it is possible to have a near live setting with the centralized platform for trading and post-trading activity. So basically this is a, a massive efficiency gain of course, uh, re, uh, using uh, the blockchain technology. That, this is, uh, as I mentioned, a wholesale 
central bank digital currency example eventually. Another one is the, I already mentioned it, is the EE1, so the digital currency of uh, the uh, Central Bank of China, which is, of course, it is a, a national digital currency project based on blockchain and the cryptographic technology issued by the People Bank of China. This is a, a, a two-tier system where the PBOC, the Central Bank of China, is issuing and redeeming the Central Bank, the EE1, exclusively to selected firms banks and companies. So basically there are, it is a centralized approach with, where the Central Bank of China partner with the largest uh, commercial bank, but also with some important domestic pay, payment platform, including for instance, the very well-known WeChat Pay and Alipay, so that in the end the digital currency will be made available to the retail sector. So the EU one is an example of a central bank digital currency issued to retail customer. And in fact, the pilot is already involving millions of persons across uh, China. So let me now turn uh, to the actual result of the survey, which will allow us to go a little bit more in detail about, uh, uh, about the, the issues surrounding the, the question of, of digital currency. So please confirm if you can still see the, the slides. Max, I'm, I'm seeing the old slides, so maybe you need to. Can you see now? No, no, it's still the old one. I think you need to stop the old, uh, the old slides. Let me and see, then... sorry, let me see. Maybe because I move out of, uh... let me do it again. Now you should see the one. Yes, we can see now. Perfect, sorry about that. So basically, first of all, let's talk about the timing. Is this a revolution which will happen in the next uh, 25 years? I think absolutely not. When we ask in our survey, by when do you expect to have the first official retail CDBC launch by one major central bank, so one of the G7? Actually, the response was between uh, uh, the majority is more than 50% responding within the next five years. And actually, when you look at the wholesale CDBC, which in the end, in some way require less, there are less issues because there is a more restricted number of users, actually they nearly 40% expect this to happen within the next one or three years. So this is something which is already happening and will hit us uh, very soon. It's not something which is uh, just a dream uh, of this, uh, some tech savvy expert, but it's something which is already going to change very soon the way we move money across uh, across the jurisdiction. Then, of course, we have uh, here. You can see the the involvement of many central banks are involved, and you can see that around a third is already involved as we speak in a pilot project concerning the issuance of central banks and digital currency. And more, and then we will have a 50% over the next one or three years. But I'm just looking at the watch. I would like to really focus now on these slides. So the first question is when we ask central banks, who ultimately are the issuers of CDBC, why are you issuing a, a CDBC? Now, the, the, the most obvious one is that to improve the answer, which is a 70% of responders, is to improve the retail paying system which I think makes absolutely sense. If the use of cash is falling dramatically, for instance, in Switzerland, where I live, I already don't use cash anymore almost ever. And if you go in certain countries, like for instance, in the Nordics of Europe, the use of cash is already being reduced dramatically. So of course, once they are simply adapting themselves to a sort of a de facto situation that is already existing in the payment system. Then they have, a, they have, of course, the concern about crime and money laundering. So they, if they issue themselves, they have more control. But what is, I think, is very important are the next two, which is, first of all, about the improvement of the financial infrastructure, so the payment system, which is the one which is all being impacted mostly by the uh, technological revolution. And the fourth one, which I already mentioned to you before, when I talk about the key drivers of the rise of digital currency, more than 50% of the respondent mentioned the pressure that they feel 
from stable coins and cryptocurrency. So basically central banks are reacting to a bottom up decentralized process of financial innovation, which required them to upgrade and adapt the way they issue currency. So to move it to a digital format. Now, when we go in terms of uses, it's very interesting because of course, as I mentioned to you before, the retail use dominates, but the next two are very important. We are talking about two, one pillar of globalization, which is immigration. You can see that remittance, which are very expensive for people working in uh, over a, a jurisdiction to move money back into their own country. Sometimes this can oscillate between five and 10%. Of course, the digital currency can become a very powerful tool to reduce dramatically the cost by having much more efficiency by basically using the blockchain. But also very important is about the cross-border payments. So basically the central banks believe that uh, by having a, a, a digital currency issues by their jurisdiction, this will make easier to make cross-border payments. Something that I will come back afterwards when I will try to draw up some conclusion. Now, the next question is very interesting about the risk that of course emerge from the central bank's digital currency. And here there is the question of the risk of a disintermediation of the banking system and the potential impact on financial stability. That's actually something that you can you hear and you see in the press when you hear regulators across many jurisdictions taking a very uh, a, a cautious approach to cryptocurrency because are completely unregulated. There is a clear link there with financial stability and central banks around the world, in particular in the developed economies, but not only, they are concerned about the fact that if the, uh, the digital currency grow uncontrolled and, and without some clear regulatory check and balance, there is a risk for the financial stability. And uh, this is also reflected in the next question that we ask about, about the basically what type of architecture do you prefer? So first of all, as I mentioned to you before, digital currency can be centralized or decentralized in terms of how they are traded. And here you can see that actually the majority of central banks clearly favor a centralized approach, which is the one typical of CDBC, for instance, the E1, where the PBOC is the issuance in collaboration, of course, with some commercial bank, which will be very similar to what is currently happening now with the way the fiat currency are uh, managed and issued by the central banks and distributed via the banking system. The second one, which is, I think is also very important is uh, that more than nearly 80% believe that this should be a general purpose uh, digital currency, a retail one. And I think this is very interesting because they, do, of course, uh, the wholesale digital central banks and digital currency could be completely unnoticed by retail, by individuals. It would be something which remain within the spectrum of a limited number of operators at the very high level. Instead, central banks realize that this revolution has to touch the consumer in the way they shop, in the way they pay. Second, last point, which I believe it is very, very important, is that nearly 80% of our survey institution say that this should be a single country issued. And this is really fundamental because at the end of the day, and you, some of you, the one who are more into this topic, they might have heard of proposal of issuing a global digital currency pegged to a basket of currency. Sometimes they call it a digital STR, special drawing right. In reality, currency is about sovereignty. If you think about it, the most important uh, sort of sovereign power that a country has, it is the issuance of its own currency. Think about uh, the UK, who didn't want to go into the Euro because they didn't want to give up their own currency. And think about the resistance within the Euro area to give up their own national currency. It's been a very long and sometimes tumultuous process. Now, the last uh, uh, point, of course, uh, goes back to what are the implications eventually, what type of change the rise and the issuance of central banks and digital currency will eventually entitle. And here, sorry, oops, apology, I have, yeah. yeah. 
One is about, uh, first of all, uh, will you invest in, in, in CDBC? And here you can see that this is where everything remains pretty open. More than 70% of central banks do not know yet whether they will invest into this currency, into, sorry, into the digital currency eventually issued by countries. The second point is about the currency. Will eventually central banks' digital currency lead to the fall of the US dollar as the dominant reserve currency? Actually, more than 60% say they do not believe that this is the case, which basically means that ultimately the dollar still has a lot of appeal among the central banks in the world as a sort of ultimate safe haven in terms of the financial system. And also with the oversight of the coin, we also ask, Will a digital yuan eventually accelerate with the internationalization of the RMB? And here there is a little bit more of a mixed view, but still more than 50% do not know eventually if this will be the case. Now, the last point I would like to mention is something that is very often mentioned in, uh, in, uh, in many, in many, in many circles, which is the one about uh, um, the use of uh, the replacement eventually of a cryptocurrency with gold. You might hear very much that the Bitcoin is uh, some way linked now to the, to the performance of gold. This is a very interesting topic, but I believe it is a topic that does not have yet a very strong uh, uh, quantitative uh, uh, evidence because uh, first of all, the period is too short, but still there is a view that eventually going forward a digital currency could become and could replace gold as a safe haven, uh, as the ultimate safe haven, and eventually also as an edge against inflation. Let me, sorry, I, I will stop sharing this and I will uh, try to conclude and apologize about the switching in and out. So you remember uh, that uh, at the beginning of my presentation, I asked myself the question was, will the global financial system be disrupted by digital currency? Now, from what you heard and from all the different uh, uh, information and trends that I mentioned to you, there is no doubt that digitization is equipping uh, national currency with the very important new futures. Blockchain is de facto the technology that support the creation of new medium of exchange. Now, what does it mean is that there is, by creating, by making a medium of exchange much more efficient and more easy to use, this increases competition between currency and eventually their use in the global financial system. In fact, I mentioned to you that the expectation is that one of the new futures of the digital currency will be an improvement in the efficiency of cross-border payment. So this means that the central bank's digital currency will remain local in the sense that it will be issued by a single country, in their domestic, by a domestic country, but their increased cross-border use will increase. So this also means that there will be very important new opportunities also for the smaller currency the one which have always, which have never been used in the international transaction because of the fact that the incumbent, the dollar, the dominant one, there were clear benefit to use the dollar. So the dramatic, the question then becomes, uh, will the, the dominant role of the US dollar will, will be challenged? I think this is indeed the case, but the question is that uh, the dollar is, will not stand still. First of all, because we already hear uh, U.S. authorities already talking and eventually I would suspect as well working uh, on the sideline in the preparation eventually of a digital dollar. So the game is still very open and it will be incredibly interesting to see how the competition and the dynamics of the global financial system will change when both China, Euro and the, you, the, the, the America will have digital currency competing between them. So what will be the final outcome of all this? I mentioned to you that the world is already moving towards a multipolar system. 
where actually you have uh, three main blocks. But actually, as a result of technological innovation of blockchain, of DLT, it might well be that the final outcome will be a world which will be centered around a multi-currency system, which thanks to platform, which are able to connect between them, will allow also the smaller digital currency to be, con to be competitive as a, a mean of payment. So I would like to conclude by saying that uh, we are definitely in the middle of a disruption of the global financial system. We can already start to see the emerging of some important foundation of a digital financial system, but still in terms of how it will look like, particularly in terms of which currency will eventually be dominant, is still very much open and competition will be fierce. I would like to stop here uh, and ready to take any question you might have on, uh, on any topic that I touch in the presentation. Uh, thanks, Max. Um, thanks for that presentation. So we have a lot of questions in the Q&A chat uh, from our audience. Shall I read it and, uh, and then provide the answer for everybody? Oh, yes, you could do that. Um, that would be great. Thank you very much. So how can the first question is from Aaron. How can China at this scale not create a massive destabilizing of its financial system if it open up its financial system to be a fully floating system? The amount of forced saving SOE investment to sovereign control capital. I think this question is a very valid one not necessarily related to the issuance of the central banks a digital currency. Now, China has uh, clearly uh, uh, has been on an opening uh, path in, of this uh, financial system uh, for a very long time now. Uh, we actually, it's very interesting to note that this, uh, this uh, gradual opening, which has been done, of course, according to the timing that best fit the growth ambition of China has never been really reversed. Also during period of, for instance, uh, uh, turmoil, for instance, in 2015, you might remember when there was uh, a devaluation of the RMB, uh, a mini devaluation of the RMB, actually the Chinese authority did not detract from the continuous opening up of this financial sector. And uh, also currently where China is going through some, uh, uh, some issues, as no, we have not seen any sign of China uh, not continuing on his uh, opening up. So I believe that China already made the choice a long time ago of a control opening of his financial system, but I believe this process will continue and eventually will be completed once, once the domestic market are uh, in some way uh, reach the standards which will allow to manage a floating exchange rate. The second question was from Stephen Murga Trayot. Some years ago, China threatened to destabilize the US by selling of his huge holding of US Treasury bonds, but back off as it would bounce back on China. But to be honest, this is not really China. This is our media speculation, which always mentioned this is a potential tool for China in terms of, uh, of using his, uh, his, uh, his uh, holding of uh, US Treasury to destabilize the world. I just believe that this is a fantapolitics simply because it would destabilize itself. So I really don't see the value added for China uh, to do something like that. In the case that sovereign government can ultimately defeat the treat of non-government digital currency by simply pulling the plug as with the great China firewall. I, well, if I understand the question, it's more about the competition between uh, uh, private uh, uh, currency, uh, digital currency and uh, central banks uh, digital currency. I believe the central banks are doing the right thing. To be honest, I don't think that you can have a, a digital currency eventually taking a, a prominent role in, our, in the financial system without having the backing or the control and all the regulatory requirements that we have in any financial system of the world. And this is due to the fact that the financial stability would be put at risk. And I don't think the central banks will allow that to happen. Is the notion, uh, sorry, then is it from Vince Orlando, is the notion of a EU super state resisted by several sovereign members, Poland, Hungary, a material risk to the Euro? Uh, this is an interesting question, but not related to the digital currency. 
to be honest, I, I, have, uh, I have a different views about uh, this. Euro, as I mentioned to you briefly when I started this presentation, is going through a period of, uh, of transformation. If you remember well, as I mentioned in 2012, as a result of the sovereign uh, crisis, the Euro was almost put into, the whole Euro project was almost put into jeopardy. Actually, if you look at how the Euro has been uh, doing over the last uh, few years, particularly also during the pandemic, the Euro area has reacted pretty well in terms of, uh, for instance, the launch of the next generation fund, which in some way it is something which has always been mentioned as missing from uh, the construction of the European project. As you know, the European, U the European the Euro area is mainly a monetary union. What was missing is some uh, degree of fiscal integration. The next generation fund, which has been uh, launched during an emergency period of the pandemic, can become uh, the first step towards uh, uh, a more uh, common uh, uh, sharing of uh, the fiscal burden going forward. I think this is very important because ultimately, I think that's where uh, that's the destination, and I can see Europe, uh, the euro area, eventually going along this route. Also, I believe the environment where Europe is moving much more volatile with the confrontation between the two largest economies make the importance of the Euro project even, even stronger than it used to be before, in the sense that the more uh, the US look inward and China look inward, the more the Euro area will have to think about its own stability without eventually the support of, uh, of the US. And uh, last point, uh, you might also uh, talking really about currency, the Euro area is already involved into the preparation of, the, of, a, Euro, of a digital Euro actually has already spelled out, uh, sorry, already communicated a very detailed uh, uh, program, which will be completed by 2000 and end of 2024, by when eventually after that all the pilot has been completed and all the pro and cons have been considered, they are in the position of issuance a uh, digital uh, euro. Um, I have another question from uh, Stephen. Another reason why government don't want an internal digital currency because they would have to balance their budget and not be able to infinite weigh their debt. Um, I think, uh, I, I, I don't agree with this. I don't think that the question of the debt is linked to the fact that there is a digital currency or not. I don't think a digital currency will, we should not forget that we already live in a digital world. The money doesn't move between banks when they buy treasury or when they buy euro bonds. I think the debt story is a completely different one, which has been driven by different dynamics. I believe there are other factors at play, and uh, I don't think that the digital currency, in a way, I don't think the position of the government about digital currency is in some way dictated by the level of the debt they have to deal with. Now or in the future, I think over consideration are more, uh, are more dominant. What will be the effect on countries that depend upon the US dollar? This is a very good question. Because, for instance, there is, as you know, one important uh, Panama, of course, uh, if uh, uh, Panama, let's say it is a dollarized country, so in the end, uh, they will uh, simply adopt the digital currency of the US if they decide to go for a digital dollar. But I think what is interesting is about what countries, the, the countries which have tried to de dollarize their economy will do. As you know, de-dollarization has been a very important trend in certain countries, think about Russia, but also in some other countries, for instance, in Latin America. Why is that a trend? Because the de-dollarization, it is a way to reduce your dependency from the monetary policy of the US. It is obvious that if your economy depends on the dollar, you will be subject to the fluctuation in US interest rates. And this is something which we've seen happening time after time around the world. And uh, because, of course, the U.S. fix is rates not based on the use of the dollar across over jurisdiction, but on domestic priorities, which is the inflation in the U.S. and the employment level in the U.S. So from that point of view, it is interesting to see where the digital currency will eventually accelerate that uh, um, de-dollarization, because we'll make it easier to uh, use a currency uh, compared to the fiat currency, which uh, of course has not been eventually particularly successful is the dollar is dominant. Also, we, there, are some, there has been some episodes 
in Latin America during the pandemic when countries that normally reverted to the dollar when in period of draw up of liquidity, actually they went to the, to the Bitcoin and digital currency. I don't think, I don't know if it's very wise, but it's definitely something happening as well, as well in that context. Uh, from Jim, uh, Bitcoin is already said to use 0.5% of the world's electric supplies. How will we spread global use of digital currencies possible, especially with the current emphasis on environment? Very good question. It is absolutely true. It is something that in the end, uh, it is being discussed a lot. I think there is definitely a problem here which needs to be addressed. I know that there is a, a lot of conversation among platforms, for instance, Ethereum or other platform to reduce the amount of electricity which is being used to, uh, to transact uh, the digital currency, but this, uh, in particular, this, in this case, the private uh, currency, but it is definitely a very, very big uh, topic which will have to be addressed in the future. Do you think the central banks, uh, sorry, from Tony, do you think that central banks will be scared competition by stable coin issued by banks or other parties if they don't do it in a timely manner? I think I already, I think I show you to you that definitely the action which we have seen over the last few years from central banks in the area of central banks and digital currency has already has been triggered by the rise of uh, uh, private uh, or stable coins or uh, private uh, uh, digital currencies. So there is clearly a link there. I can also see a link between the recent crackdown against a certain uh, car digital currency and the preparation for the launch of digital currency. There is no doubt that uh, a failure in issuing a central bank's a digital, car a digital currency will have an impact. But I believe that this will be done in a way, uh, in particular in terms of graduality. For instance, I, we had recently a representative of the ECB who presented some uh, estimate of what would happen is, for instance, 20% of the deposit in the euro system will be replaced from one day into digital uh, deposits. And actually the impact on uh, monetary policy and in terms of operation of the financial system would be minimal. So I believe we are going to see for sure central banks are taking a very, very cautious approach in the sense there will be so much preparation, many pilots. And actually, if you see the countries that are most advanced, like for instance, China, which is already in the middle of a big pilot project involving, as I mentioned, millions of people and consumer, I think that they will do it in such a way that it is very unlikely that it will fail uh, in, a, in, a way, in a such a way to really reduce the trust of the people in, in that, uh, in that new, new currency. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Stephen, about China's ban on crypto mining and trading, uh, which has moved to Texas. Uh, uh, yes, I think it is also part of what I just mentioned about the fact that they are preparing for uh, the the digital yuan. Uh, I, yes, I heard about going into Texas. I guess this will not reduce the use, uh, the carbon emission of, uh, of that activity. Uh, for sure, we make it cheaper, given the fact that in Texas, probably energy is, is cheaper than in other countries. But uh, I believe the US so far has not cracked down on, uh, on, uh, on the trading of cryptocurrency. Actually, you hear also a lot of uh, action around the cryptocurrency from New York. I believe that here there is a there is a, it's a, it's a very is a, there is a little bit of a philosophical uh, uh, issue. I mean, the U.S. fundamentally, outside of currency, is always a favor at the centralized approach in the sense they believe in competition, they believe in a bottom-up approach where the innovation spur from the bottom and spread across the system. But if you hear to talk, to talk uh, if I, you hear especially in this area from the Treasury or from the <clears throat> from the Fed, you hear very clearly that one, they cannot allow to have an uncontrolled rise of digital currency without a check and balance because of the concern about the stability, financial stability and potential losses for retail investor. And at the, second, at the same time, they cannot allow to have a, a un, unregulated cryptocurrency replacing the fiat currency because of the, of the sovereignty. <clears throat> So this, I don't see any more questions, unless there are more questions, I'm very happy to take them. Yes, I have a question. So basically, 
you are having companies uh, like Tesla put Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Do you see that happening to other corporates um, going forward? I mean, what happened with the, it's a very good question because uh, after the failure, I would say, uh, let's call it the PR failure of, uh, of the currency uh, that you mentioned, which was a typical corporate currency. Actually, we have not seen very much action in that level, right? I have not seen, okay, they relabel re re with a new name. I got the feeling they will look a little bit more closely this time at the regulatory aspect of it. But I believe a corporation at the moment are looking at two trends. One is the disruption in the payment system, which doesn't require them to do very much, right? They, they require them, of course, to adopt the payment system which are being developed, but they don't require them to issue or any, anything. And at the same time, you have, uh, they see the central banks that are starting to work pretty uh, heavily on, uh, on central banks' uh, digital currency. I believe, but this is just my personal really opinion, I don't have a sort of, I believe that we are seeing a similar situation. If you remember well, when the FinTech revolution started, they were already saying, well, sooner or later, Google and uh, will become a bank. We get a license and we'll start competing uh, with banks. In reality, this did not happen. And I believe because uh, the, 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 the big social media and the big tech companies uh, like Facebook and others, I think they understood that when you move into the financial sector, you move into a very regulated sector and it could not be otherwise because there is a public interest involved into it. Currency is not just about buying a pair of shoes. Currency is about uh, the backbone of a country, if you think about it. It's about the stability of the country. So I think that uh, they are taking the same, uh, exactly as they've been taking a more wait and see attitude on the banking level in terms of offering banking services I believe they're taking as well a wait and see approach, the corporates, I mean, in terms of seeing how this old story will eventually develop, particularly with regards to the speed and timing of the replacement of fiat currency with digital currency, central bank's digital currency, I mean. Yes, I have a, another question. So in the US, you're having a, a, a lot of these ETFs, exchange traded funds that have been approved by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, although they're mostly futures uh, that, are, that are not spot uh, products. Exactly. You know, so, so how do you see, do you see that trend sort of, uh, sort of I mean, there are, going forward? I, th I think, well, there are expectations for more uh, ETF being issued, for instance, for Ethereum. Uh, you, might, uh, you might wonder, do, you, do we really need a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, ETF for uh, Shiba, I don't know about that. But let's say that's a little bit more exotic, at least for an old banker like me. But uh, I believe that the regulators around the world, they need to navigate a very interesting uh, situation, which is uh, a bottom-up innovation, which is very powerful and is going very fast and it could not be otherwise, right? The disruption that we are living in leads to exponential growth. That's what I learned in my education when I had to start understanding how technology <clears throat> impacts the world. So they, they, I think, and at the same time, they need to ensure financial stability and, and uh, ensure that the switch from, to a digital world in the world of uh, finance does not create too many risks for financial stability. <clears throat> apology and does not create a problem in terms of protection of the consumer and investor. And I think they're trying to strike the balance. So I suspect that we continue allowing some innovation bottom up, like the one of ETF coming more on the, from the crypto world. But at the same time, I believe that their main focus is on, uh, on CDBC and ensuring that the, the switch to the digital world will, uh, will happen smoothly and we will move from fiat currency to digital currency without any major disruption and more in terms of financial stability. That's my personal view. And I think it is a sensible view. Okay, thanks. I think we still have some questions in the chat. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, sorry. 
surely with a centralized ledger from the central banks in CDBC, we don't have to deal with proof of work like Bitcoin. So electricity and energy users should not be an issue. Um, it is correct. It is correct, but to be honest, I, I could not judge uh, based on my knowledge what is the, the level of uh, electricity use in a centralized system. But I would expect that you're absolutely right and the use of electricity in a centralized uh, digital currency world that would be lower than the one done by um, in a decentralized system. And then if crypto, from iron, if crypto is on the balance sheet, its volatility is like CDO in 2006 and eight, which can stable is underlying equity. Uh, cryptocurrency, as I mentioned, are not central banks and digital currency. And then you might have understood the, the focus. Uh, my main interest is about the CDBC because I think that's are the one which is the potential to change and replace, of course, the fiat currency. Um, I think a CDO are very different type of uh, uh, instrument. They are, of course, uh, they are, they tend to bring to, if you're referring to stable coins, in the sense that stable coins are pegged to one or more currency, I think there's something very different from, uh, from, uh, from CDO. Stable currency, they raise different issues which refer to liquidity, because of course you want to be sure that the liquidity of the digital token, which is supported by uh, traditional currency is always there and eventually counterparty risk. But I don't think you raise the same concern of the CDO, which is mainly a credit risk, which does not exist when the issuer is the central bank, which has uh, the monopoly of the issuance of the eventual CDBC. I do not see more questions. No, I, I, I'm, I'm not. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad uh, about the question because it means that the topic was of interest. Yes. So now um, I think that's the end of the Q and A. Um, I want to say thanks to our speaker, Max, um, You're to our My pleasure. audience, and to the FinSIC committee. So I will see you next time. Then. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Once again, it was a pleasure. And apology about the tech issues at the beginning of the, of the event. No, thank nothing. you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone. See bye you bye. next time. Ciao. Bye. Bye.